be in Tallahassee. It's uh, 20 degree here. I'm from Toronto and there is snowy and it's minus 10. Uh, so this is a big change in temperature. So I'll be telling you about microscopic theory of skin interactions in honeycomb systems. Uh, in fact, it's a combined effect of synovial coupling and correlations. Um, so while I was uh, flying because I was in Korea until Sunday, and then I flew back to Toronto on Sunday night, uh, and then I teach there, taught the class on Monday and Wednesday, and then I flew here on Thursday. So most of the time I had to prepare this talk in the airplane or lounge or sitting in an airport. Um, so let's see how that goes. It's a lecture, it's a theory school, so I am intent to go slow and present you most of the uh, background. Um, so as you're looking at the physics problems, uh, of course one can do coarse grain gauge field theory, but uh, when you go to the microscopics, uh, then of course we are looking at the uh, degree of freedom. So we have charged in orbitals on a lattice, and depending on what type of lattice we have, we might end up with different types of the uh, microscopic uh, Hamiltonian. And then once you have those degree of freedoms, then we'll be looking at the energy scale of the problem, like uh, such as electron-electron interactions, uh, screen to Coulomb, Kunz coupling when you have multi-orbitals, uh, and synovial coupling, and crystal field splittings because it is in the solid, and etc. Then you can start building up some relevant microscopic models, minimal models, and find the ground state, and compare with experimental measurement, and plot some phase diagrams, and so on. So here, I'll be focusing on the synovial coupling, which is this part, in a certain lattice system, and uh, a strong Coulomb interaction. So to prepare this, I was thinking, okay, this is one of the um, review articles uh, written by uh, William and uh, Leon and Yong Bae Kim, uh, they have summarized uh, that uh, uh, if you have like a Hubbard model, which is the hoping and uh, uh, Hubbard interactions, and put up some synovial coupling, schematic phase diagram as a function of the Coulomb interaction versus the synovial coupling, you have various different types of the phases uh, in this phase diagram. Um, well, simple ones like a mold insulator when synovial coupling is uh, small and simple metal or band insulator depends on the problems. If uh, the U is very large, we can get some quantum spin liquid and or even some multi higher order um, quadrupole moment and things like that. What I'm gonna focus today is going to be finite synovial coupling. So I'll start with the synovial coupling here uh, where one can find when the U is small, one can find the either topological insulator or semi-metals or even nodal semi uh, load a line of the semiconductors, uh, semi-metals, uh, and as you change the U very large, then they'll be ending up synovial coupled, uh, entangled mode insulator, and in some cases, this leads to the good type interactions. So my talk, my lectures will be here, starting from the bottom here, and then moving all the way up here. Okay, I hope that's clear. So where this is applicable? Well, in fact, a lot of systems, um, um, because we'll be interested in the strong synovial couplings as well as the Coulomb interactions. Mainly, the physics will be applicable in this uh, transition metals where we know that electron-electron interactions are important. And, uh, and then we'll be looking at a 4D or 5D systems where synovial coupling is uh, significant because of heavier atoms. The one that I'm gonna tell you today, uh, first lecture will be mainly uh, layered perovskite. Uh, where you see a nice uh, topological band structures. And then the second lecture uh, will be mostly focused on this honeycomb iridate or rutinate where good type interactions, in addition to good type, other interactions does show up <coughs> and how one can derive those uh, from a, a simple, like a, um, some Hubbard interactions or extended Hubbard interactions. Okay, so here's my outline. First lecture, is based on the symmetry in force Dirac semi-metal with the synovial coupling. So this is applicable for the layered perovskite, as I said, uh, iridiums, but it has uh, smaller, smaller Coulomb interactions. Um, in particular, when you have uh, n equal to infinity, this will be 1, 1, 3. It's a three-dimensional system with a nodal ring of the uh, forming surface uh, that pops up based on the, their um, 
um, tight binding plus the spin orbit coupling. So here the spin orbit coupling plays a very important role. And then in the second lecture, I'm gonna add a strong Coulomb interaction here. So difference from here to here is that U becomes very large. And uh, when you have in this situation in a honeycomb, uh, what happens is that you generate this G-type interactions in addition to G-type other terms pop stars. So this will be a part of the uh, second lecture. Um, and these are the references uh, where you can find uh, most of what I said. Uh, in particular, this review article 2016 contains most of what I say in the second part. And then first part will be found in this uh, uh, PLB paper when the issue comes. Okay, good. So the first part, let's begin. So symmetry enforces Dirac semi-metal with a spin, strong spin of coupling. Uh, given that this is the uh, lectures uh, for student, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna remind you something that you have uh, studied in the class or uh, some quantum mechanical class where it has spin orbit coupling and then moving into 2D, uh, 2D systems. And then here what's important is a non-symorphic symmetric, uh, which I'll introduce and some of you may be uh, familiar with it and some of you may not, but I'll go slowly anyway. And then we'll move to the 3D case where um, the Fermi surface is become a line of the ring um, with a Dirac, Dirac dispersions or linear dispersions and how they pops up is going to be a part of the first lectures. Okay, so atomic spin of coupling, <coughs> it's, uh, yeah. Uh, so that depends, for example, uh, in this case, well, can I talk about that later? Because if uh, in, in solid, we do have, for example, I'm dealing with atomic spin of coupling here. And then, so you have one atom with a strong spin of coupling, heavy atoms. And then let's say iridate is surrounded by oxygens where oxygen is a small spin of coupling. And uh, in that situation, the uh, oxygen, depending on whether oxygens are playing an important role or not. So if oxygen P orbitals are well below the chemical potential, then you can ignore the oxygens because iridium iridium orbitals will be the main player as they are near the Fermi levels. Uh, on the other hand, if oxygen, instead of oxygen, you got a chlorines or other talcogenide systems where P orbitals become near the Fermi level, then they do come and play and you have to think about combined spin orbit coupling. So that depends on the, the uh, atomic um, potential of the, the other atoms. So most of cases we don't have to worry about it because uh, oxygens or chlorines are well below the chemical potential. They live around minus two electron volts below the chemical potential. Then they're, they're, they are basically uh, giving the pathway to uh, uh, spin interactions, but they don't really a main player. So that depends on the systems. Okay, good. Um, so do stop me if you have any questions. Uh, and if I go a little fast or slow, so you can uh, stop me there. So atomic spin orbit coupling, as we know, it's uh, nothing but a relativistic effect. If you're looking at the rest of frame of electrons, uh, this is electron moving around under this uh, Coulomb potentials. Uh, so when they move, uh, because they are moving, you end up with a uh, um, magnetic field and that magnetic field couples to their own spin. So you can see that this magnetic field coming from this D O sub R, you can see that you write in terms of R cross D, which is an angular momentum, and uh, that couples their its own spin, which is uh, magnetic field to the MS, which will give you L dot S. It's atomic spin orbit coupling, it's a site. Uh, and lambda is proportional to, if you're looking at the just the simple one atom uh, physics, then it goes as the atomic numbers to the fourth power, so heavier atoms, bigger the spin orbit coupling. So this is what we learn in a, um, um, some quantum <coughs> mechanics class uh, uh, about the spin orbit coupling. So now let's think about, um, so what you do in that is that consider P orbitals, for example, and we have PX, PY, PZ, like hydrogen atoms with angular momentum one. You have three degenerate P orbitals and they are aligned in you know, some perpendicular, some, some, some directions of X, Y, Z. You know, it's a combination of spherical harmonics and if you put the lambda, which is L dot S in a given site, again, it's atomic site, I emphasize that uh, you can rewrite them in terms of the total spin, uh, which is the J. And uh, one can show that if you have angular momentum one with a spin half, it's a three half and a half. So that's uh, straightforward. And uh, if you can find the wave functions, the half here 
will be a linear combination of all the three, but they come with the different spins because Px and Py here will combine angular momentum of the one. So you have down, down, which will give you a spin up for the pseudo spin, while the z component here has to be up, will give you the pseudo spin up. So when you see the pseudo spin, the real spin is a mixture of up, up, down with the, you know, this i here, which plays also an important role because they generate angular momentum one, and in this case, minus one. And between the two, you can do the time reversal uh, operator to get the other ones. But again, this is atomic site with no motions and why they become important. So let's uh, think about where you see the Rashba spin-over coupling versus the Rashba light spin-over coupling. I'll tell you what it means, Rashba light spin-over coupling. It means that both of these has a momentum dependent spin-over coupling. So those who have studied semiconductors, uh, dealing with the uh, heavy uh, bismuth, um, you are dealing with the P orbitals and P orbitals has uh, J equal half and three half and half is heavy band and light band and most of those are J band, the, the total J rather than real spin. And uh, if the inversion is broken, we say, well, we have spin over coupling, but uh, microscopics are coming from the atomic spin over coupling. So they are not just coming from uh, out of blue, it's coming from here. So let's think about it. Now here is I said, okay, I have Px orbital and Pz orbitals. And uh, this is two site. I have site I, site J here, and electron uh, wanna hop from here to here. Because we don't break the time reversal symmetry, spins are conserved. I have to move up to the up, uh, meaning that this is the Pz up to the Px up and Hermitian comes straight. On the other hand, because of the symmetry in this problem, you can see that the Pz is odd under z to the minus z, the little reflections here, while the Px is even, this hopping integral is zero by the symmetry of the lattice. So on the other hand, when mirror symmetry is broken, then T become finite. So what does that, if you do it this on the lattice and put them all together, then you can see something different from the uh, uh, just uh, um, the atomic uh, low momentum dependence spin over coupling. So what makes the decision of the, whether this uh, Px and Pys are perpendicular or they are mirrors are broken is the basically crystal structure. So crystal structure, if you have ideal pair of sky, for example, then X, Y, Z is like a couple of, you know, this is a cubic. And uh, in this case, if you have Px and Py, uh, Px and Pz, the hopping integral will be zero. On the other hand, most of the systems, uh, 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 this is uh, the other like uh, manganese or kappas and so on, you do see that at low temperature, they have this uh, autorhombic uh, distortions or other distortions that pops out. And those are determined by the um, other atoms uh, surrounding the, uh, your main player. So here is a transition metal which are surrounded by let's say oxygens, and uh, those oxygens will tilt it because it's a low temperature, the crystal symmetry is broken from the cubic, tetragonal, and orthorhombic. So orthorhombic has a lower crystal symmetry. Once those symmetries are broken, you see that the, their local axis of X, Y, Z depends mm -hmm. on the only the, uh, the surrounding atoms. So here blues will be tilted one way and red is tilted the other way. So once those symmetries are broken, the local axis determined by other atoms inside a solid, and you can see that, well, I have tilted from the one way to the other, and if the meter of the Z is broken, then you do have finite T here. And that finite T, when you have a, so the, the real spin, I didn't change. I have Px to a P, Pz here. Uh, however, if I write this in the pseudo spin basis, that pseudo spin basis, Pz, again, remember that Pz up belong to the pseudo spin up. On the other hand, Pz, Px up actually belong to the pseudo spin down. So I end up with the P, uh, pseudo spin up to a down. I flip the pseudo spin while without flipping the real spin because real spin you can't flip unless you break the time reversal. But here I flip the pseudo spin and that pseudo spin flip will generate a finite T. So when I do this in a uh, real all lattice, then I end up with moment, and then do the Fourier transform of uh, entire mm -hmm. lattice, you end up with a momentum dependence spin over coupling. If you don't break the inversion symmetry, you can see that this P has the same sign with the next ones and so on, end up with the cosine terms, which is uh, even under K to the minus K, and then sigma Y here is because I flipped the pseudo spin. So sigma polymetrix is in fact the pseudo spin half in that basis rather than real spin. And that's just telling us the motion is different. 
And uh, so you can see the atomic spin of recoupling crystal structure generates a momentum dependent spin of recoupling. If inversion is protected, then end up with a cosine even function under the K with the sigma Y. This does not break time reversal because sigma Y changed the sign and but I is here. So you can check if you're Hamiltonian, this, this type of the terms break time reversal or inversions and so on, it does not break any of those. On the other hand, if the inversion is broken, then one can show that in this uh, picture you have plus t here, you have minus t there. So because of t and minus t difference, uh, it end up with a sign of the ky, the sigma dot. And if you expand this in a small k, end up with k cross the sigma dot, the z hat in, in all, all of the in two dimensional uh, case, then this is nothing but the Rashbrook spin of recoupling. So that's how you generate the Rashbrook spin of recoupling. And this is what that used in the um, semiconductors, heavy semiconductors with bismuth and Simonis and so on, when people are dealing with the uh, few orbitals with a strong spin of recoupling. Yeah. What's the ratio of the inversion? The number depends on the, uh, the uh, again, the atomic, <coughs> atomic, uh, atomic number jet. If you're dealing with the bismuth, uh, it's about electron volt, one electron volt, it's huge. Yeah. If you're dealing with a transition metal, iridium, for example, then atomic spin of recoupling is about 500 MeV, which is 0.5 dV. And uh, iridium is a 5D orbital. It's extended compared to the 3D orbital. So your Coulomb interaction is also reduced compared to kappa, for example, 3D orbitals. So then spin of recoupling and the Coulomb interactions are comparable. But they are not like a 0.5. It's about two electron volts in the 5D iridate. So you can't ignore the spin of recoupling in the transition metal with 5D. On the other hand, if you are dealing with the semiconductors where the J between the three halves and half split by one electron or two electron volts, then yeah, there is a spin of recoupling is the dominant one. And your Coulomb interactions can be ignored. That's why semiconductor, we don't have to worry about most of time. We don't have to worry about the, uh, the strong electron electron interaction. But if you have a transition metal, talcum and I, which is, we, I call it Van der Waals mode insulators, there you have a transition metal with uh, uh, talcum and I, which is like a chlorine, for example. There you have <coughs> to again, back to the problem of spin of plus the Coulomb interaction. Yeah, so that's the energy scale of the problem. So that also depends. Yeah, you could, but uh, uh, you, you, you have to do something different from what I did. But in principle, yes, you could. So it depends on what, uh, I haven't done it, but I am guessing that one could. Because they uh, have to come from somewhere of the symmetry of the lattice plus the spin of recoupling. So the physics could not be different. Uh, well, the crystal symmetry, something has to be different to get it, I would get, think. But I haven't checked. But you know, spin orbit coupling does not break the time reversal, so they should break. They should not break time reversal, but they break inversion to get that. Yeah, they are both odd under the k to a minus k. So uh, the way that I've done it, it's an example here. So in this example, so I am dealing with the scale lattice with uh, uh, one direction with uh, sine kx, and the other is a sine ky. So you can see that this comes with that forms. But if you're dealing with, uh, for example, instead of uh, uh, other inversion has to be broken in a certain way, then depending on how you break, you might end up with a different form here, which can be dry flower. Yeah, so yeah, I would suggest that you can try, but uh, I think that uh, the symmetry wise, the, uh, you know, you can see that this is inversion is broken, but time reversal is not broken. Something has to be satisfied. So there are many other forms that can be possibly generated. This is just one example that I have tried with a scale lattice. Okay, so that's uh, about the spin of recoupling. Now in solid, that's not everything. We have a crystal field splitting. So if you have a crystal field, spin of recoupling and crystal field combined effect is going to be different from just one atom, uh, one atom splitting. So let's think about the single D electron in a crystal field. Uh, so I have, this is S orbital here. This is uh, uh, five different D orbitals in atomic physics and they are surrounded by six of N ions, which is say oxygens. So that's our Schrodinger equation with the uh, UL and VCL here. And VCL here is going to be this uh, 
the uh, surrounding um, negatively charged electric oxygen atoms here. So that Coulomb interaction will change the atomic uh, <coughs> energy levels and uh, you can work on this and just writing the five by five matrix and then write down this BCL as a sum some of those uh, um, expectation of the Coulomb interaction between uh, D orbitals with all of this uh, oxygens or P orbitals and, and so on. And then if you do this, then one can write down and uh, the, the you can diagonalize this and then one can find that the crystal field splitting will split uh, this D orbitals into three and here and two and there. And based on the symmetry that one can say this is DQG and EG orbitals, which are two-fold degenerate and three-fold degenerate. Um, that one can also do it from a symmetry argument. So in this case, what happens? Uh, so that's uh, just the crystal field splitting. What happens if I combine the crystal field splitting and uh, spinor recoupling? So if you add a spinor recoupling, then um, now let's say that uh, in this case, the energy scale crystal field splitting is larger than the spinor recoupling, okay? So here, EG orbitals are much higher energy compared to the T2G here. So if I ignore the EG orbital, in other words, I write down L dot S in this uh, L equal two, and uh, you remove this uh, EG orbitals, which are G square and X square minus Y square. So if you remove this uh, two of those, and look at this three by three matrix of the um, spin orbit coupling terms here, and that corresponds to exactly the same as uh, uh, P orbitals, L equal to one, except that L has changed the sign. You can see that here, I here, minus I, and so on. So if you put the, if you project out the EG orbitals out of the Hilbert space, dealing with the T2G alone, and then put the spin orbit coupling after that, then this uh, angular momentum would act just like angular momentum of minus one instead of L equal two. So then uh, this uh, will, T2G will split into half and three half. You see that three half is a down here because L is minus one rather than one. So P equal one had a three half up here, half is down because generally that's what J prefer, smaller, J is uh, normally down and uh, when lambda is positive, um, but this is upside down. And uh, if you have iridium four press, which is uh, five electrons, and you can see that I can fill up the up, 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 and down, down, left with a completely filled three half and left with J effective half. So we are dealing with the problems where it's a half filled pseudo spin half, pseudo spin half problem. Okay, so another thing that notice is that, um, so in this J effective half, the wave function, again, similar to the P orbitals that I give you, this uh, is going to be a linear combination of, so this guy here, I'm ignoring three half because it's completely filled. This three half here is going to be a linear combination, equal composition of the uh, T2G orbitals. Again, XG, YG, X like X and Y of P orbitals. Uh, XY, X like a PZ here. And you can see that pseudo spin up here is gonna correspond to up here, but uh, these two are down, down. Uh, is the one that compose, you know, that contribute to the pseudo spin up here. And then time reverse operator will generate the other ones. Yeah. I have a question on the wave yeah. So is everything in bulk then? Yeah. So everything is bulk? Bulk, yeah. So you can add the bulk and then everything is half of the bulk. Everything is bulk. This is atomic. So I have one single atom. Yes, later on, so yeah. So, okay, so instead of, so that's wave function, instead of thinking about, okay, so, uh, <coughs> all right. So I instead of thinking that way, let's say that you start with the one atom, okay, the way that I'm doing it, you put the N one atom, and then you put the spin over coupling there first, and then you generate the, then you generate the infinity crystal, and then check it out, you're hoping between them, between them. Okay? And that hoping allowed by the whatever the symmetry of the lattice, will generate a different type of <coughs> momentum dependent, momentum dependent hoping, momentum dependent spin dependent hoping, which are called RASPA or JPOWs or something else. So, so that'll be. No, that's what I'm saying, no. 
So that's the one thing that uh, one thing that you can just break inversion to have a rash bus spin Ovi coupling. Rash bus spin Ovi coupling is a consequence of the spin Ovi coupling plus the inversion token. So you need atomic spin Ovi coupling to begin with, and then inversion symmetry has added. Correct, so what I'm saying is that inversion is different from meter. So if you break inversion symmetry, in addition to atomic spin orbit, you have rush bus spin orbit coupling, and something like a dress out, which also break inversion. Anything that odd under the K to minus K, you need to break inversion. On the other hand, the term like a cosine KY that I written earlier does not break inversion. It's an even function under K to minus K. And those momentum dependence, spin dependent terms does arise if you break a meter alone. Okay, so it goes beyond or different from the rash bar, although they come from same physics of atomic spin of coupling, depending on what you break, you end up with rash bar or momentum dependent spin of no, momentum dependent spin dependent hoping, but it does not break inversion. It's a cosine KY. So it just breaks the meter symmetry. Meter is uh, different from inversion. So uh, here I just want to show you that the, uh, you can start from crystal field here and then put the spin Ovi coupling end of here, or you can do the other way around. In other words, you start from 5D and put the spin Ovi coupling first, which will give you a five half and three half, and put the crystal field, you end up with the middle, which is the same, okay? So, and as I said, that if you have half field, just like a 5D5 or 4D5, then end up with half of the field, and this is supposed to be a metal because I feel the half. Uh, so this is gonna give us a band theory to give us the metal, but, uh, uh, if you have a uh, strong interactions, uh, that's not the case. Okay, so as I said, you do the same thing. Uh, strontium titanium oxide, which is another interesting one, but strontium titanium oxide is a tetragonal. So that won't give you anything like this that I have discussed. Momentum dependence, spin dependent hoping does not occur in this. Uh, if you have a strontium iridium O3, this is orthorhombic. So this, this one will allow to have finite hoping between the two different uh, uh, XZ and XY, I call that XZ is a one-dimensional light, and then XY is a two-dimensional orbitals, and those one will be, become finite, and that will generate, mm -hmm. again, pseudo-spin flip terms. So here's one take-home message, is if you have intet in tetragonal structure, there's no way to generate the pseudo-spin flip terms, hoping interval between the XY upspins, and then XZ slash YZ ups, uh, the downspins upspins is uh, zero because of that meter symmetry. So this is different from rash bus spin orbit coupling again. Uh, but it's very important to get generate the nodal line of the semi-metals. Yeah. So what happens if the flip term is zero and then I get a flip term of this kind? So that depends, okay. So th the question is then how big this term is. So, so T prime here will depends on the proportional to the broken meter string. So the angle, if you have angle of the seta which rotates the um, octahedra, and that octahedra angle will be proportional to the T prime. So you can show all of these things can be derived from a small T primes. And uh, in some cases, uh, it become very significant. So here's a one example. You can have a 2D layer of the iridate with a J equal half. Um, and uh, so here is uh, some AB sublattice. Uh, this is the sublattice is not because you have two different atoms. It's the same atom, iridium, iridium. But this iridium is surrounded by oxygens which are tilted one way, and uh, B atoms are tilted the other way. So normally they, they tilt it in a staggered pattern. So this is very, very common. Although real strontium-2 iridium-04 is a multi-insulator, and so this is just uh, made up, uh, it's, it's a, if you make ideal case of this, then uh, with the U is very small, then that's what happens. Okay, so now you have, we, you can again, you know, think about this, uh, um, uh, this, uh, uh, hoping in hoping process, and those hoping process that allows to have this hoping between the two different orbitals with the same spin will be the same as the pseudo spin flip terms. And if you introduce a poly matrix that represents the pseudo spin half and subplot is AB, which is a tau, then you can write down the tight binding model here, where you see that there is this uh, subplot is dependent as well as the, bomb, the spin dependent sigma x and sigma y, which will have momentum dependence k here and k there. And both of these will be a cosine-like because it's an even under the k to minus k because I didn't break the inversion but just broke some meter symmetry, okay? 
So that can be done, and you will see the band structure is something interesting. Um, now, one thing that I have to know is that there is a extra symmetry left, though, what is, uh, is called a non-small fixed symmetry. It's a fractional translation of the Bravais lattice plus the point group rotations. So in this lattice, what happens is that if you take, so non-small fixed uh, symmetry is a fractional translation. So for example, if I start from the A sub lattice here, and if I move A by half to B axis, okay, because here the unicell is doubled. So your unicell is no longer going to be this way. Unicell has to be A to the red to a red, which is along the A axis, uh, and then red to red here, B axis. So A, B represents your unicell of the, which has a two sub, two, two sub lattice in a unicell. So if I move A, sub a atoms by half of the B, and then do the meter along this uh, B, C plane, which is this plane that I'm writing, and then uh, it's a plane out of, uh, coming out of the both, and do the meter along here, A will map to the B. Okay? And then so this one has so-called B glide symmetry. So translation by half along the B axis, reflect with respect to the B, C plane at A equal one quarter. So this one will stay A equal to one quarter. So if you do that, then uh, this, this lattice maps to itself, and we call that, okay, this one has a B glide symmetry. So another way of writing in this mess is that uh, I don't change the C, but B has been shifted by half because I translate by half of the unicell, and then A is shifted by one quarter of minus, well, half of the minus A because the reflection was done at A equal one quarter. Okay? If I do it in a one quarter, then you will see that this is half minus A. So that's where this mapping to here. So when you have that the big light symmetry in this problem, band topology is uh, have something interesting. So yeah, these are these are these are, uh, these are staggered. So you have this is uh, iridium, uh, not iridium, okay, iridium oxide. Say for example, you have two different angles that are associated with it. Uh, one angle is a rotation around the z-axis. And the other angle is a rotation in the phi here, which is tilting away from AB plane. So there are two rotations associated with octahedra. And they are tilted, they are staggered. <laughs> staggered out of plane, because otherwise you don't have that uh, meter Z is broken. Uh, it is still glide. You can work it out. Okay, so. That's uh, glide, and then um, if, uh, so the phi here is a tilting, if you don't tilt it, then one can show that this bend is completely degenerate. It's called sticking bend. Sticky bend appears between this particular <coughs> momentum space. So one can show that this is coming from a, some uh, rotational symmetry, which is 90 degree rotational symmetry. But even if you tilt it, so now you tilt away from the AB plane, which will be that, which still has a big light symmetry, by the way. So you have finite phi, which is the tilt away from the AB plane. Um, you still have big light, as I said. And uh, you work it out the band structure, the, 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 the tight binding, and you can add whatever you want it, like a nearest neighbor, next nearest neighbor, third nearest neighbor, doesn't matter. Whatever you add it, <coughs> you'll end up with this X and Y point, which are degenerate. So this, this point here, which has some linear dispersion, is in fact protected by the big light symmetry. Okay. So this symmetry is, uh, we called it enforced by the Dirac semi-metal with, uh, uh, again, some strong spin over coupling. In other words, you do need those uh, uh, sigma x, sigma y dependent terms that are coming out of here. So to give you a little bit of better idea what is this non-smorphic, I want you to start from one dimensional system, okay? So that will be uh, even simpler. So again, Non-small fixed symmetry is the uh, is point group plus fractional translation. So think about the one glide plane, which is this one-dimensional system. Uh, these are made of AB sub lattice. It's 1D. I move by uh, halfway here, and I consider only spinless fermion. Okay, so it doesn't have spin half. This is spinless fermion in a 1D chain with two sub lattice brother. You can write down the general Hamiltonian that does not have the time reversal. So this is written in an AB sub lattice, so P prime here is an A to the A sub lattice, A to the A. So this will be hoping from A to the A here, which will be uh, this one hoping here, or B to the B, which is that one here. 
Now you can add AB hopping here. AB hoppings uh, arbitrarily form of AB hoppings, which can be because uh, A is within the unit cell and the other is outside the unit cell. So you will have one term, which is one and e to the minus IKA. And then T prime here, T1 here, sorry, T1 is imaginary, I put it, so you break the time reversal. So you can break the time reversal if you want to by adding the T1 term, and then this whole thing become complex. So work it out some general Hamiltonian, and uh, what one can show is that the glide operator in this uh, tau is AB sub lattice basis can be written this form here, uh, and uh, if you scare it, the eigenvalue uh, can be obtained because eigenvalue of this glide operators has to be half of this because G square is always uh, e to the i k a. A is a unit cell from a to the a or b to the b. So half of this is e to the i k a divided by two, and one can show that the when you're starting from the k equal to zero, so two pi. In fact, that the at some point this uh, uh, one of the band which is coming from because I have two sub lattice, I have two bands out of the two sub lattice. And uh, if you're starting from the um, k a equal to zero, move all the way to pi, you can see that g press uh, the band which is characterized by glide operator with eigenvalue of press will move from low energy to a high energy and then the other way, the, and then the other one for the uh, g minus move the other way. Mm -hmm. So they have to cross at some point here and they come up with the two different uh, glide eigenvalues. So that crossing point with the two different glide operators cannot be broken unless you break the glide symmetry. Okay, so this is a general case uh, without the time reversal. If you add the time reversal back, then T1 is zero, all my hoping parameter become a real, and, uh, then, and also I don't have a spin, so time reversal is one, square is one. It's a spinless fermion, so T square is one. And you can define the, um, the complex uh, operator, which is a glide times the time reversal, and one can show that it's uh, set at the square will act as a minus one at the k a is equal to pi because e to the pi over a times a is e to the i pi, which is minus one. So this operator act like a, act like a Kramer, act like a, the effective time reversal. So that means that there is a Kramer's degeneracy. So that will appear at this point. So if you break the time reversal, this crossing point appears somewhere arbitrarily k. On the other hand, if I put the time reversal back, it should appear at the halfway between the zero and a two pi. Okay. So this is uh, one way to check with the one dimensional uh, case. Okay. So now let's move to the, oops, 3D iridate <coughs> here. Um, how am I doing in time? Am, am I supposed to end 9.30? Uh, you're one hour and 15 minutes. Yeah, okay, good, okay, all right. So. Now, so that's uh, what I was trying to do it uh, was that it's a two dimensional system where you can add a spin of it or other lattice and uh, looking at the band topology, you still have some kind of protected uh, Dirac point despite that there is a spin of coupling and that should come from non-smorphic lattice symmetry. Now in 3D system, something more rich can happen. So 3D iridate, this is back to the little bit of phenomenology that the uh, Iridiums uh, with uh, um, strontium iridium, so they come with the layers. Uh, uh, this is like a high TC cupra H structure. So this is 2 and 4 is isostructure to the lanthanum 2 kappa O4. And uh, just like a cupra H, you can add uh, two layers, three layers, mm -hmm. and then if you go to the infinity layers, which is a 3D, 3D system, it's a 1, 1, 3. And uh, you can see that the resistivity as a function of temperature, the 2D layers, as you add more and more layers, this become a metal insulator to a metal transition occurs. Uh, and this metallic state has been seen to have a very small carrier density. So it's a semi-metals. And they come with orthorhombic perovskite that I have told you, different from strontium titanium oxide at low temperature. Okay, so in this case, another one that uh, want to emphasize the 2D, as I said, in the 2D uh, case of uh, iridate, it is actually a magnetic insulator. What I have shown earlier is that uh, if you have a large U there, in addition to what we have done in this band structure, so if you put a large U, then there's a magnetic order appears and that actually breaks some of those glide symmetries and um, you will have some uh, both insulators. 
And those uh, magnetic order comes with a little bit of uh, antiferromagnet in a layer, and then the other layer is slightly condensed. Right? And one can show you know, optics. So this is optical data, and optical data also show that there is a lower Harvard band, upper Harvard band, and so on. And in, as you go into the 3D system, it becomes uh, semi-metals. So it has a semi-metals as you move from two lay well, single layer to a three-dimensional system, or it's a dimensionality driven um, metal insulator transition. Okay, so now let's back to the, uh, get to this guy here, strontium iridium 3 The lattice symmetry of this is called the space group of PDNN. Okay, so it has more than one glide. It has so-called B glide, N glide, and there's this meter that appears. So now the top view is same as what I showed you earlier, that it's a two-dimensional system has just like a big light here. But as you put it in the 3D system, it looks like this. This is a unicell. So the red and blue appears in the one layer here, which has a tilting, I'll call the tilting is tilting. Or, so this is theta is a rotation around the z-axis. And then phi is a tilting, which is away from the AB plane. So it's a tilted from the AB plane, it's a phi. And in this unicell, you have four atoms, which is red, blue, as well as yellow greens. And they come with a different tilting. It's a staggered tilting and staggered rotation. It's very common. This is one of the most common orthorhombic uh, space group that one can see uh, in, the, in, in nature. So you have four atoms, as I said, because of this different uh, octahedra rotation surrounding the iridiums. And uh, what one can show is that big light, again, this is within the, within the AB plane. N glide, whenever N comes in, it involves the C axis. So it's moving along the end of this. And then there's a meter symmetry with um, in the C equal one quarters in this case. So these are the some space groups uh, that uh, uh, big light is a reflection of the A axis. And then you know, it's like a move by one quarters and so on. So I'm not going to repeat this. I'm going to introduce three poly metrics because the one sigma for a pseudo spin, uh, tau for a B and you know blue and red in the two sub lattice, nu for a layer because I have four of those uh, atoms. Okay, so the glide planes is X like this. So you can write them down. Tau is uh, Pauli matrix between the blue and uh, red atoms, which has two different, uh, um, yeah. So you can see that this one has the uh, opposite theta phi, and then yellow and greens has this uh, relative theta minus phi here. So they're all staggered in a certain way. So I need to have at least two Pauli matrix. Of course, I'm not gonna use all of them because it's redundant. Um, so when you're writing down the tight binding models, you will have certain terms up here. You can check with the symmetry and make sure that they are all consistent with the symmetry of the lattice. Um, so again, here is the one that I already showed you in the 2D case, 2D layers. You move by half along the B-axis, reflection at A equal one quarter. Move by half along A and C, reflection at B equal one quarter. That's how you read it. The pi m is a meter at c equal one quarter. So whenever you see the reflection at a halfway, the one quarter, you end up with half minus the c and here and here. So you can read it from the formula, what is the type of symmetry that we have. And then because it's a reflection, this is no longer spin less problem. It's a spin full with a spin half. So when you do the reflection around this, uh, using a quantization axis of spin, this will also flip the spins, it'll apply to the sigma x and sigma y and sigma z, okay? So that appears. Now to understand uh, if there is any node alliance or Dirac point protected by those uh, small peak uh, lattice, what you have to do is that uh, you first define the inversion times the time reversal symmetry, which calls that operator. And that has been seen in many cases. So set operator, so you take the inversion of the space a, B, C become minus A, minus B, C, and then time with a minus B, and then spin with I sigma Y. So that's the time reversal times the uh, inversion 
this operator. So this is going to be set operator. What one can show is that uh, uh, if you take the product of the two operators, for example, this set operator with a, let's take n glide, you can do with a big glide, but let's take n glide, for example, one of those n glide, that uh, this product, if you do the product first, the zeta n, the pi n, this is the formula that we get. On the other hand, if you do it first with the n glide, with the time, the, the set operator, in fact, you can see that there is a difference, you know, minus half here, minus half here, minus half there. So they don't commute generally. And uh, the, if you want to make them to commute, well, not commute, if you want to e equalize them, make them equal, you need another translation by one, 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 because it's generating a one, one, one difference, unit cell ABC. So this will be equal to e to the IKA minus IKB plus IKC. So that equalize. So now what you can show, on the other hand, if you have uh, Hamiltonian at a KB equal to pi, so it's a, remember when you have time reversal, the degeneracy appears at the uh, zone boundary, like uh, even in the spinless case, um, this case here, this is zone boundary compared to the zone center, which is the <coughs> zero. So here, if you take the KB equal to zero, you can show that this operator in fact commutes. Uh, so the block states can be classi the classified by the eigenvalue of this n glide operators at the KB equal pi as well as KB equal to zero. Um, so now, if you take the pi n sphere as it is, you end up with, uh, similar to the pi b spheres that we did, you end up with minus e to the ika plus ikc, and eigenvalues will take a plus minus of this value, half of this, okay? So these are some of the mathematical uh, steps that one go through to show you the following. So the reason that we are doing it this is that in this uh, spin full case, spin half has the Kramer's degeneracy, which I'm sure that uh, you know. So that uh, Kramer's degeneracy is telling us that if I take the phi of k, so you can consider phi k as one of the block state at a k point k, okay, given momentum k. If I take the set operator, the set is going to tell us that this and the phi k will be degenerate through the Kramer's degeneracy. Now, so I have a Kramer's pair at one is a phi k and the other is set of phi k. What I want to show you that if I take kb equal pi plane, so this appears when kb equal pi and kakc can be any arbitrary numbers, any arbitrary momentum. Now, if you take the operator pi n with this uh, Kramer's partner of the phi k, which is set of phi k, then you can see that because they don't commute in general, you see this one, remember that uh, this has to have this T111 translation if you want to switch the operator. So I have to put this T11 in here to switch the operator. So I end up with this uh, uh, Ka, Kb, and Kc here. If I set the Kb equal to pi here, I'll generate the minus sign here. And then I am allowed to switch this too. So I end up with set up pi n. So to, to, to switch the operator here, I need to add these phase vectors which is one, one, one translation. And uh, you can see that if the phi n k has, uh, let's say, plus eigenvalues here, let's, so assume that phi n has a plus eigenvalues, which is a plus of this guy, plus i with the e to the i k here. This, eigen, this phi k block state has uh, n plus eigenvalues. And now I set a set i here, and then I multiply the space vectors, I end up with uh, I sign again, because the set I will change the minus I here, minus I plus minus here will generate to the plus I. So what he's telling us is that if I have a block state phi k, my Kramer's partner, which is a set of phi k, will have same eigenvalue of the N operator. Okay? So because of this minus sign that pops up. On the other hand, if you have KB equal to zero, then because I don't have this pi here, this is zero here, I don't have this minus sign here, so I end up with opposite eigenvalues. Now why they are important is simply because the block state and the Kramer's partner of the block state same eigenvalue of glide, and the other case has opposite eigenvalues. So what it means is the following. There are two possible cases where KB equal to pi plane, so I, this is the zone boundary of my CD Boolean zone, and, and that plane, I have a Kramer's, I have a bend, which will be doubly degenerate 
because in an entire case space, because I don't break inversion or nothing, this is time reversal is intact. So this will be a doubly degenerate. It's a Kramer's pair, so I'm moving one dispersion like that. And then I have another one, let's say, crossing like this. But now note that this uh, block state of one of my block state phi and then set up phi, which is my Kramer's partner, will have same eigenvalues, which is plus plus, for example. And I have another band coming out. Let's say they have a same eigenvalue of the end glide operators again. Say this was minus minus. When they cross it here, because they always meet with a different end glide eigenvalue, because they are different, they are protective. So if any perturbation that comes in has to be odd under this end glide to break this degeneracy. So this degeneracy are protective uh, due to the end glide symmetries. On the other hand, if you are in the KB equal to zero, remember my Kramer's partners, Kramer's partners, which is, so this is one of the phi block states. This is a set of phi, which is my Kramer's partner, will have different eigenvalue of end glide. So I'll have a plus minus here, and another band will come with a plus minus. So when they meet, so this meeting is, of course, some, you know, the, that depends on the energies uh, of the problem. They can probably cross and out there. So in some sense, this meeting itself is an experimental, but once they meet at the, some particular band, these guys are not gonna broken by any of this perturbation that does not break and glide. On the other hand here, you see that the uh, red, red, which is the same uh, glide eigenvalue meet and blue, blue meet. So in principle, any small perturbation that is added to the problem has nothing to do with ion glide will open up the gap here. So KB equals to zero, these are not protected. So this appears only it's a KB equals to pi because of this half of the half of the fractional translation. If you have one shows, this might appear in you know, some other uh, momentum places. Okay. So that's the uh, whole uh, essence of those. Now, in this case, we have only one of those points. Uh, in reality, in this uh, one one G case. You have a two glide planes. I'm not gonna go through this because it's getting really a lot of the math. Uh, if you have two glide plane, in this case, B glide and N glide, one can show that B glide, N glide is actually perpendicular and one can prove that the Kramer's partner have same eigenvalues of this glide operator in a particular plane like this. And they will appear in every momentum here. So this will appear to be a Dirac ring. Okay. So you have one point if you have one glide if you have a two glide planes, which are perpendicular, uh, there is a particular momentum, you will end up with a uh, uh, Dirac nodal semi-nodal. So that is, this is a dispersion. This is a energy and this is going to be a um, dispersion of the, of the um, electronic dispersion. And this is just showing cut off here and cut off here. That's how the angle I admit. And those are the points corresponds to this point where degeneracy is protected by the some glide symmetries. This is not a fiction story. It's, uh, in fact, that you can do the density functional calculation for the strontium iridium or tree. And uh, LDA plus U is that uh, spaghetti uh, uh, band structures. Uh, however, if you put a strong synovic coupling, then the J equal half is separate from three half here. They are mixed here. You can sort of see, you know, if you do the some tight binding, one can show that there is some mixtures here. But at the Fermi levels, these are mainly a J equal half. Uh, initially, you see that there is a Dirac point, which might be a 3D Dirac point. It's a three-dimensional problem. This particular U point is uh, pi, you know, KB equals to pi, by the way, um, nearby there. And so initially, it looked like a 3D Dirac, but if you zoom in, then in fact, it's not a 3D Dirac point. In fact, it's a ring of the Fermi circle. So how the ring is made around that area is that you have two of the Dirac uh, dispersion, which are shifted up and down, and uh, the one they meet is going to generate this circle here. So this is a nodal line near the Fermi levels, and that has been kind of, ring itself has not been seen, but RPS has seen that uh, this particular Dirac point has been found in this particular compound. Okay, so I think um, that's uh, more or less uh, the first part. Now, so that's uh, how synovic coupling with a lattice symmetry without even breaking inversion uh, with uh, some non-smorphic lattice, one can generate some interesting topological band, but these are kind of protected by some lattice symmetries, okay? And with uh, some strong, strong synovic coupling. Um, 
the next one that I'm going to talk after the 30 minute break, hopefully, uh, that uh, now we are gonna add the strong correlations U here. And uh, with uh, some of the dispersions that we have learned in the layer perovskite, you can also do that there, but then you end up with uh, the conventional dalosinski moria interactions. So I'm not gonna discuss that part. I'm gonna use that in the honeycomb lattice that we've learned and then, uh, and then see how the spin interaction can be generated once you have large U and how that momentum and spin dependent terms becomes important in this, uh, in this uh, spin model. So that's the first part and I'll begin the second part. <laughs> Yeah, so you can make it rod bigger because uh, remember that uh, how these rings are formed is based on the rotation and tilting. So you go back to all the way to a microscopic, the reason that these rings are popping up is because you have rotated and tilted. So if I make the rotation and tilting large enough and sustain the lattice, uh, which is probably difficult in the, in the lab, but in principle, if you can tune it, then the ring can be bigger because those size is proportional to the theta and phi, the rotation and tilting of the octahedra. If you can tune it, yeah. Well, transport measurement will be hard because it's hard to differentiate Dirac from even semi-metal to the small puppet. Um, STM is another way to do it, but you have a surface shape to worry about because this guy is actually much richer than what I have told you. This topological um, nodal line has the helicoid surface shape. So if you do that STM, there will be a bulk shape as well as the surface shape, then one has to know how to differentiate them. So in principle, yes, uh, the Dirac point will not have this helicoid surface shape, but uh, the Dirac ring will have the surface shape, which is helical. So in, in, in principle, it can be, it is doable, and uh, ARPES, uh, not the sur the, I mean both the surface physics, uh, but they know how to differentiate bulk to, uh, bulk to a surface shape. So there is a way to differentiate them, but they are both STM and ARPES. I don't think the, uh, the transport will be able to differentiate them. Yeah, so magnetic breakdown, um, if you have, um, so in this particular ones, um, you have only a ring, right? So if you put the magnetic field, this actually has very interesting Landau levels because one direction is the Dirac, but the other direction is not. So it has anisotropic, it, it has a quite, a, depending on the what direction of field you apply, you have different uh, Landau levels. So that has been also studied by some other people. So yes, in principle, there is a particular direction you can do a, um, the uh, magnetic uh, the oscillations. So you can do quantum oscillations if the ring size is reasonable enough. So yes, in principle do it, but be careful because Dirac dispersion along that direction is gonna give you different uh, Landau levels. So one has to work it out before you go into the measurements and guide the measure experiment that uh, your field has to be this particular direction because remember the ring appears in the KB equal to pi plane, which is perpendicular to the B axis. So be careful with the B fields and you know, so on. And you can generate, if you put the field in the ABC, you generate the different, uh, different, um, different, uh, the disper this different um, um, the Fermi surface. In other words, if you put a B uh, along the C axis, you open up the gap and you become an insulator. If you put it in a B axis, this ring is, uh, it's a Dirac, but if you put the field along a particular direction, these two rings, split and then it become a two cross the ring 
which will be vial. Because I break the time reversal, I'm allowed to have a vial form, form vial, vial forming surface. So I'll end up with the two crossed vial ring. So it has a very rich uh, topology due to <laughs> at least three different uh, non symorphic symmetry here big light, angle light, and n meter. Well, I don't recall, I mean, that reminds me one of the uh, questions that was, uh, so I remember I was giving this talk in the APS, uh, uh, and uh, my first speaker, I mean, we, we were in invited sessions, sessions and Kane, the Charlie Kane was before me, and so Charlie, after Charlie Kane finished his talk, I'm supposed to give the next one, and uh, one of the questions that was given by a student in the audience to a Charlie Kane and say, you know, why do we care? <laughs> this doesn't have any application. Why do I care about the topological insulator or topological insulator? Yeah, so is there any application? So that's what was the ask. And I think that's a very natural question. I'm not, you know, being negative, I'm positive. I'm saying that this is very natural question from a student point of view as well as, uh, and someone like me who cares also applications because I work on the thermoelectric materials as well. Uh, because, you know, you put the, tri you know, heat, uh, you can use the waste heat to generate the electric field. For now, I don't think there is any clear application at this stage, uh, but I think we shouldn't give up, uh, meaning that it's a heavy atoms. Most of these things are uh, pretty good thermoelectric with a large figure of merits, and uh, some of them might have related <coughs> to the sum topology. For example, Li Yang Fu was here last time, and he worked on the you know, this uh, topology, how this topology is helping to get the large figure of merit in the thermoelectric materials. So I think there might be some of those, and uh, I think some of us should be, well, not should be, at least will encourage to be interested in, um, but I don't have one at this stage for these particular ones. Yeah, so uh, good. Um, so in fact, that this, this I'm pretty sure it's published at some point now. So um, this was, this data, I saw it, uh, I was in Japan at that point, um, at least uh, eight or seven or eight years ago, a long time ago. I saw this data and I immediately jumped into this material because of the reason that why it's a semi-metal rather than just a big metal. So because you start working on this and you know the Fermi surface, and then as you move into putting the layer, you would expect a large Fermi surface. So that's a natural way to think if you know how the bend of the two arm four look like. And I know how it looked like because I've been studying a high PhD problem. So I know how it looked like. I know it has to be a large Fermi surface. But it's a very small and the number is about 10 to the eight um, per cubic centimeter. So it is a small eight, 18, sorry. <laughs> 18, not an eight. <laughs> eight is like a terrible, 18. Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's like a thousand or 10,000 smaller than the most of others uh, metals. So then I realized, oops, uh, there is uh, something, something interesting in this uh, uh, Fermi surface. Uh, and uh, I don't recall the effective mass, but you can kind of calculate from here. 